Happy Holidays! Thank you so very much for listening to This Matters in 2020. What you are about to hear is a rebroadcast of one of our favorite episodes of the year. We hope you enjoyed as much as we had working on this show. We hope you have a safe and happy holiday season, and we look forward to continuing the conversation in 2021. And please consider supporting all the journalism The Star does at thestar.com subscribing matters. From the Toronto Star, I'm Rajiv Mudder, and this matters. Murder hornets, the largest hornets in the world. We don't know how they got here, but they're here. This is literally the stuff horror movies are made of, like 1978's The Swarm. We have visual contact. Identify. A black mass, sir. A moving black mass. We have been invaded by an enemy far more lethal than any human force. For many of us, it doesn't take a swarm. If we see a regular bee buzzing around us, we become just like Nicolas Cage in The Wicker Man. Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! With the news that the Asian giant hornet has been found in British Columbia, it really feels like the world has decided that in 2020, this time it's personal. But if you've been worried by the news of the arrival of this invasive species, today we're bringing you a conversation with a pair of beekeepers who took on these bugs and lived to tell the tale. Alex McKean, a reporter in the Star's Vancouver Bureau, spoke with John and Mafita Holabushin. Here is their conversation. John and Mufida, thank you so much for joining us here and coming onto the podcast. Thank you for having us. We're very glad to raise awareness on the Asian giant hornet and bees in general, honeybees and pollinators. Absolutely. First of all, first and foremost, murder hornets. That's a name that seems to be sticking for these things. So the two of you have actually met them. Have they earned that moniker? (laughs) They're they're big. And they pack more venom than the other uh, stinging insects that we've encountered out there. Whether they murder people, I don't know. They do kill people between 40 and 50, I think, in Japan every year. But, you know, they're not going out there purposely trying to kill people. That's right. Okay, well, we'll get to your own showdown with this particular hornet in just a moment. But before we do, I was wondering if for our listeners out east, you can help situate us a little bit. Can you tell us about where you live and the beekeeping community there in Nanaimo, British Columbia? Sure. We're both Nanaimo beekeepers. We belong to the Nanaimo Beekeepers Club that has beekeepers from all over the central island. It's been in place for many, many years, long before John and I joined seven years ago. We became aware of the Asian giant hornet issue through a Ministry of Agriculture news release on September 11th last year, where they indicated that there were three sightings that were found in close proximity in the Nanaimo area. With that information, John and I read everything that we could on the Asian giant hornet over the weekend. And Paul Van Westendorp, the chief provincial apiarist for BC, had contacted the Nanaimo Beekeepers Club executive and was reaching out to them to try to organize a search in the Nanaimo area. With communications back and forth, we received the coordinates that the Ministry of Agriculture had collected for those sightings on September 18th in the afternoon. And I'll turn it over to John to explain what he did with those sightings. So I took the sighting location information, plotted it out on Google Maps, and found that they were all in a very relatively tight area near Robbins Park. You know, it couldn't have been in a more perfect location. It was smack dab in the middle and right on the end of Honey Drive. Mufita took one look at it and said, if I was a hornet, I'd be right there. It's kind of a low-lying forested area near water. We decided uh, we would take a look, more to survey for an upcoming uh, Search. search in the area. We didn't expect to find anything, but five minutes into the park, I spotted them flying over the trail. I knew pretty much right away what they were because we knew what we were looking for. As I was calling Mufita over, I managed to get stung by one. 
I was about 20 feet from the colony at the time, completely unexpected. I was kind of stunned for a moment. It was a very sharp, piercing pain, which slowly turned into a more of a physical pain, like somebody had kicked me in the chest. Felt more like a bruised rib than a normal sting. While I was standing there, I slowly realized that Mufita was yelling at me to get away from there. Apparently these, like a lot of other stinging insects, will uh, kind of mark their prey and then their buddies will come over and start stinging as well. That was our encounter in the park. After that, we went home and tried to put together what to do next. I am just trying to fathom what it would be like to get stung by a hornet that's close to five centimeters long. Well, the first thing I did was grab my shirt and pulled it away from my body just to get the stinger out. I don't know what shocked me more, the pain, the size of this thing, or the fact that I got stung at all, or that this thing was like six inches away from my face. It's pretty surreal, this creature, this insect that is almost never seen in North America. And here it was basically in your backyard, certainly in your hometown. Yeah. And on the the drive back home, I had moments where I was questioning if it really happened. It just seemed like it was such a a surreal instant, like an out-of-body experience. And Mufita, from your perspective, I think you were ahead of John, that's right. And then you turned around and you saw these hornets going towards him. Can you tell us what that was like? From your perspective, what unfolded there? Well, at first, when he called me back and he says, I see them, my husband is a bit of a jokester. And so at first I said, oh, come on now, stop kidding around. So I didn't believe him. And then he was pointing and I looked at where he was pointing. And sure enough, I could see them as well. I was about 15 feet away and ahead of him. And I was frozen and I couldn't believe it either. And then when he got stung, what was going through my mind was, first of all, if any of the other Asian giant hornets come after him, because I'm well aware of him being marked by the alarm pheromone and how it attracts others. So I couldn't do anything. If he had been attacked by more hornets, I would be helpless short of putting myself at risk. I would have to drag him away and risk being stung myself. So all of that was going through my mind as I started yelling at him that he had to move right now because obviously he was in full frontal view of danger right then and there. And this is a venom we're not familiar with. We regularly get stung with honeybees and I'd read all the paperwork on the different toxin that this venom has and its ability to damage your liver and you have to go on dialysis. It doesn't take a lot of stings to really do systemic damage in addition to the usual honeybee allergies or sting allergies. So All of that was going through my mind and how to get John to move. And then once he had moved and he was okay, I still had to go back to where he was standing. And how do I do that without getting stung? Because now they were aware of our presence. So I waited for a few minutes and I could see them going over the trail. And I thought, okay, I have to do this now or I'm just going to be on the side forever. So I ducked down and methodically but quickly moved to where John was standing and crouched down at that spot. And then I grabbed my phone and recorded the GPS coordinates because I knew somebody had to come back. I had not imagined that it would be us. And then I went to join John and I pulled his shirt up (laughs) and I took a picture. I said, what the heck? We'll be right back. aren't that many people who, when they discover that there is an Asian giant hornet, the world's largest species of hornet, 
in their area, there aren't a lot of people who would then choose to go looking for them in the first place. But then again, not only did the two of you manage to find this hornet, you also went back there a second time in order to eradicate it. How did that go down? Well, when I got home, John's disbelief that it actually happened turned into him telling me that he had to go back. And <laughs> and I was saying, no, you can't go back. I need to monitor how you're doing because I have no idea what this venom can do to you. And he was hit in the chest. And so I made sure he sat down and he had some Tylenol. And I, I had to start thinking about, well, this is no longer a search endeavor or initiative that we were trying to organize. We were now in a different kind of initiative, which was to extract and eradicate it. And that's something I knew nothing about because we're beekeepers. We can manage swarms of bees and we do for the Nanaimo area, but extracting completely different species that is potentially deadly is not something in my experience or John's. And with his desire to go back, I thought, okay, I need some help and I don't know what I'm doing here. But I recalled that I had a colleague at work. I work for the Ministry of Forest, and he works in the Ministry of Environment. And I knew he was both a beekeeper and an entomologist. And he was on the list of people who had volunteered to help us on the weekend find the nest. So I looked up his home phone number, and I called him up mostly because I needed to talk to him about, well, what should we do now? Because John wants to go back. I don't want him to go back. I'm terrified. So talking to Conrad, he explained to me that he had experience extracting wasps in his career for pharmaceutical companies and that he had the equipment and he had a CO2 fire extinguisher, which is what you use to stun hornets. He didn't have experience with Asian giant hornets. However, I had enough confidence in him that I told him, that sounds like a really good idea, but I really, really need to talk to Paul because things are moving a little too fast for something I don't really have a lot of experience in. And so I managed to call Paul Van Westendorp after hours in Vancouver, and he knew Conrad. And so he had confidence in Conrad's abilities. And he gave us some direction in terms of how hard they are to kill. So don't assume that they're dead. If they're frozen, make sure they're in a deep freeze and things like that. And he also gave me a request that if possible, to preserve some samples so they could be studied in terms of their origin. And that makes for a different type of initiative when we went back. We weren't eradicating it, we were extracting it, which is much more involved and takes much more time. And so when I went back to Conrad and he was assembling his equipment and we were all pitching in to get other people informed, John called our bee club president. He also called our bee inspector and we brought them into the loop. And then we gathered shovels, bags, containers, alcohol to support Conrad in what he had to do. And then we all went back there. And I can honestly tell you, as we were walking back to the nest in the dark now, where we can't even see, with these little flashlights on our heads and in our hands, I was shaking the whole time. Conrad and John located the nest in the dark and then Conrad started doing what he needed to do to spray it with the fire extinguisher and he was trying different things that didn't work like trying to vacuum them uh, the way you would vacuum wasps but they were too big for the vacuum. So there was a bit of trial and error for him and for us. And I did what I could to keep myself from shaking. So I tried to film it. And then John and our bee club president, Peter, who came, tried to help by taking the samples that Conrad was taking out by hand and putting in alcohol and moving them to all the various containers that we cobbled together from our house. I should note that the reason I wanted to go back and was insisting on going back was because I felt I needed some evidence, either a photo or a specimen, because I figured there was absolutely no way anybody was going to believe us. 
it's a hard story to believe. This is a species of wasp, like we've said, that hadn't been seen in North America, I believe, prior to last year. It's such a bizarre looking insect. It's big. It looks prehistoric, cartoonish. But that being said, Paul had no trouble believing me at all when I told him we found the nest. (laughs) Neither did Conrad. They were both on board. They fully believed me. There you go. And ultimately, you ended up being part of this small crew that went to extract the nest. So I'm just trying to picture it. You know, you go in there, it's at nighttime. It sounds like a a mission, a bit of a stitched together crew that you put together with materials from your homes. And I imagine that this time that you went back, the first time you went to the nest, you were just wearing shorts and a t-shirt. So this time when you went back, you were kitted up a little bit more. We were wearing our our winter clothes underneath our bee suits. These things have quarter inch stingers, so they'll go through most clothing. It's pretty remarkable sight to imagine. And I think Conrad was stung seven times. That's not fun. I can't believe he didn't react more than he did at the time because I did bring the second time around the EpiPen and I was quite prepared to jab him or call 911 just because he's an entomologist and he has experience with honeybees and wasps. There's no guarantees that he would not have succumbed to the toxins. Right. And an entomologist, of course, is a person who studies insects. We're kind of in this new stage with the Asian giant hornet where more people are becoming aware of it. Certainly more people in North America are becoming aware of it. What with the sightings in Washington state and even all across North America, people are starting to get worried about this hornet and the possibility that they could maybe encounter it one day. What is your advice to them? Well, take a picture if you can, first of all, and keep your distance from the nest and get help. And definitely protective equipment would be valuable for anybody going to extract the nest. I don't think we were as prepared as we should have been, but we didn't know any better. When we took the nest out, uh, we felt that there was some urgency. We were coming out of a kind of a cold, rainy few days, followed by sunny days. And the time of year was such that new queens could have been released. So time was of the essence. As it turned out, no new queens were found in the nest. We found between roughly 150 to 200 live insects and about 600 larvae. So they were just ramping up. When we spoke last time, you said you thought you thought that meant that this population of Asian giant hornets, hornets was not going to be Uh, something that you necessarily saw again year to year. Then again, as the the scientists have said, the entomologists who study creatures like this have said, you wouldn't necessarily know until later this year whether the hornets had managed to reproduce because they're not active during the winter at all. And their activity, even during this time in the spring, is pretty limited. So you may not know for certain whether or not these insects are still in the Nanaimo area until late summer, early fall. Are people in your community or are you feeling anxious about that? Do you think there's a sense that people are hyper aware for sightings of these things? I think after the murder hornet (laughs) news release, they might be sensitized for sure. I'm feeling a little bit anxious to see the end of summer happen without any sightings because that is going to be when we discover whether they're there or not. But as another thought is, in my mind, whatever mechanism this hornet queen used to establish itself in Nanaimo or the sightings in White Rock, the one sighting in White Rock and the two in Blaine, that mechanism has not been investigated And it could be the tankers. Something's changed so that these things are arriving on both sides of the Strait of Georgia. And from what I'm understanding, the source of the Asian giant hornet in Nanaimo was from Japan. The Blaine Washington one, at least one of them, is from Korea. So something's changed. I don't know what that change is that's creating the situation where we are seeing these sightings coming up on both sides of the strait. I'd love to 
end off on talking again about the bees that, of course, you take care of and many people in Nanaimo take care of and all over North America. Because this Asian giant hornet, it is potentially a risk to human beings. But of course, part of the reason that scientists are so concerned about it is the threat that it poses to honeybees. Of course, it it eats honeybee larva. And that's a real concern, not only for the honeybee populations themselves, but also for the crops that rely on honeybee pollination. And can you just tell us a little bit more about what's at stake for the honeybees that you take care of and that your friends take care of? Well, it certainly adds another level of complexity to keeping bees. When the Asian giant hornets are going through their late uh, late summer, early fall stage, they need a lot of protein to feed their larva. And honeybee colonies just happen to be a perfect food source for them. They basically wait outside the front of the hive, kill off the bees that they see. They're not after the bees. They're after the larva inside. Once they kill enough of them, they just basically move in and uh, go on a feeding frenzy. They bring the food back to the, well, the larva, munched up marva back to their colony and uh, feed their larva. The other thing that the uh, Asian giant hornets do is in the summer, before they consume an entire honeybee colony, is they will also be feeding on other protein sources. And those are all the other pollinators. So they're not just after the honeybees, they're also after any kind of insects. They also consume yellow jackets and anything that they can basically digest. Well, it's certainly a very fascinating and kind of creepy insect that you've encountered. Thank you so much for sharing your story about them. No, you're quite welcome. Yeah, well, thanks for having us and helping us raise the awareness. That was our guest host, Alex McKean, who is a reporter based in the STARS Vancouver Bureau. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Raju Mudler, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisas. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.